one of these guns is real? The one on the right or the one on the left? We'll come back to this in a second. Welcome everybody. Welcome back to those of you who saw last week's video. And for those who haven't, thanks for joining. Like, subscribe, that whole deal. I want to talk about something that's in the media a lot. It's very controversial and, you know, with good reason because there was this tragedy in New Mexico. It's very, very rare for anything like this to happen on a movie. I mean, kind of a perfect storm of just, you know, everything that possibly going wrong at once. And that's not, uh, that's not common, obviously. Um, tragedies do happen. We remember Brandon Lee. You know, that was very sad. Again, that was, as with every death like this, it was due to human error and human negligence. Okay, I don't know how many of you guys guessed left, how many of you guys guessed right. The answer is both. Both guns are real. That's the assumption that we have to start with. Why do movies use real firearms? For the most part, movies use altered firearms. They've been modified to only fire blanks. Uh, there's also guns that are specifically made that only take blank cartridges, that only fire blanks. Those are called blank guns. There's two types of those, and I'm going to go over those. There's top fire guns and front fire guns. But for certain movies, particularly period film, or for a shotgun, for instance, uh, yeah, real guns are still kind of what's mainly used. We're looking again at our two guns. The gun on the left is a Glock 17 chambered in 9mm. It fires lethal projectiles and has no place on any movie set at any time. The gun on the right, you will see on a lot of movie sets or something very similar. This is an airsoft clone of a Glock 17. It fires small BBs that, if you're not wearing eye protection, can certainly cause injury. So it's always important to check each weapon thoroughly before use. Because the title of this video is Why Real Guns Are Used On Set, let's talk a little bit about this Glock 17 and why it would never be used on a movie set, even as a holster gun, even as a non-firing prop. There's a difference between uh, how an automatic, semi-automatic handgun fires and a revolver fires. As we're going to discuss later, revolvers are often used. Real revolvers are used on movie sets, as are shotguns. Uh, a weapon like this, however, the blank that you would insert in it, the 9mm blank, wouldn't have enough inertia, enough force, enough uh, power, essentially, from the exploding gases to chamber a, a second round. So unless you were planning on shooting one shot at a time, it wouldn't work. There's so many better alternatives today than using a real modern pistol. Again, this differs a bit when we're talking shotguns, but for modern pistols, modern rifles, unless this weapon was modified to be a blank only firing weapon, it simply should never be on a set. It should never be used as a prop. It just doesn't belong anywhere near a camera. Let's start with the weapons that you're most likely to see on set. And those are gonna be pistols. Let's go from least dangerous to most dangerous. First weapon is a rubber gun. Uh, sometimes used in a holster, just as a holster piece. Sometimes used if a weapon's going to take a fall. We don't want to damage an expensive prop. This is also a good time to bring up non-firing replicas. A gun that's absolutely not capable of shooting anything out of it. Obviously, it's made of rubber. That's not going to happen. So, something that uh, obviously is the safest course of action. Where do you lose? Well, you lose in the realism. Even with the uh, composite muzzle flashes and composite shells flying out of the, it's not going to look real at close up because it's a rubber gun. And there's really not much you can do about that. It's good for quick cuts if somebody's getting whopped in the head or something like that. Uh, it's a good stunt piece, but there's much better examples of non-firing replicas. I don't really have one. And you can get something as safe as this that's far more convincing. But, I, you know, again, I have this for more kind of stunt use, things like that. And so now moving on to kind of the second gun we're going to look at here, and that's the Airsoft. Those are becoming more and more popular on set, and for a good reason. They essentially look double to their real-world counterpart. They're like almost perfect replicas. Under the right supervision, those can be fine. They fire off of essentially with the, it's called green gas, it's a type of gas, that when that fires, that cycles the weapon. When the trigger's pulled, the slide flies back just like it would on a you know, like a nine millimeter or something. And the cool thing there is you can digitally throw in the, uh, the shell casing coming out, digitally have that muzzle flash, and then you're pretty much there. The next type of gun that you could get, it's called the top firing gun. And these used to be more popular than they are now. And it used to be something like the only type of blank only guns you could buy that weren't considered firearms by the ATF. And that's a whole other thing I won't get into. But essentially what it means is that there's a plug in the barrel. It's a piece of steel or iron just in that barrel. Nothing can come out of that barrel, but it's going to come out somewhere. What ends up coming out is it comes out of the side ejector port where the shells casings are ejected. And that looks really fake to anyone who's ever played, you know, any type of video game or anything like that. You know that that's not where the flash comes out. So uh, I think you're honestly better off with airsoft than a top firing blank gun. Uh, the last type of weapon that's 
you know, blank only, meaning it's not capable of firing an actual projectile. This is a front firing blank gun. It works identical to the previous gun with the one major caveat that the muzzle flash is in the right place. That's kind of my favorite for modern movies, as long as it's allowed, as long as it's not danger close. If they're ever gonna be even in the vicinity of another actor, the angle's cheated, so that there's never like, you know, people are not gonna get peppered. I've been peppered a lot. It, basically what it means is that whatever's in that blank, you know, there's something in it. Some people pack blanks with different types of foam or sawdust or whatever that, you know, that's shooting at you at God knows this, whatever, at the speed of light practically. Um, and, and it burns a little bit and it doesn't feel too good. It feels kind of like the best analogy I can give is if someone took a, like a bunch of really tiny, tiny pebble rocks, like almost sand and like flicked them at you really hard. With this weapon here, I don't have an airsoft equivalent. This is a fully automatic blank firing submachine gun. Even in broad daylight, gives you a huge muzzle flash. Shell casings flying everywhere. It looks really great in slow motion. It's fun to shoot, but it's also really expensive to shoot. It goes through those rounds very quickly, just like an actual submachine gun would. Okay, so what we're looking at now is probably the second most popular type of firearm you're gonna find on a movie set. Two big differences between them is one of them is an actual firearm. The other one is an airsoft. For reasons I've already talked about when I was discussing the Glock, this real weapon, this real rifle, just doesn't have any place on a movie set. Not only is it capable of firing lethal projectiles, but it simply won't function the way that a blank gun will. It won't cycle the round properly, it won't chamber another one. If you were to put a blank in it, it would fire once and that would be it. Uh, again, why risk it? Why ever bring a weapon like this on set unless it's been specially modified, professionally modified to take blanks only? At which point it's no longer considered a real gun because if you put a real live round in it, that round now wouldn't fire. If you look at them, there's differences in style and such, but more or less, even at close inspection, and this airsoft's a really cheap one, you can get much better ones that really mimic a real rifle down to almost the smallest detail. Continuing with modern guns, this is something that I've actually used this particular weapon on many film shoots. This is very capable of firing blanks. It's manually cycled, so essentially that means that the user pulls the pump action and engages the next round. This is very dangerous because this is an actual firearm. Essentially when it comes to using a shotgun on a movie set, be it a period film or a modern film, you are uh, going to be using one of these. For the most part, honestly guys, you're better off unless you can have a professional armorer on set. I would really avoid something like this. I mean, introducing this element to your movie set can cause you quite a lot of problems. Now we're getting to Western guns and everything gets a little bit more complicated when we're talking Western guns. So on the left, we have a Cimarron 357, which is very similar to the gun that was involved in the rush shooting. It's a single action Colt Army type firearm. You cock the hammer back and you pull the trigger each time you want to fire. The gun on the right, it's a replica. It's a firing replica, but it fires blanks. And I took this out. I was actually really excited when I picked this up. I thought, you know, we found a safer solution maybe for when I make films like Blood Totem. The issue is it's actually not safer. Right here, in front of the cylinder, at the very end of the barrel, there's a big chunk of steel. Uh, it's not even just a chunk in there. It's basically just welded to the frame, which means that after that trigger's pulled, that blank is fired. All that energy, which causes our muzzle flash and our smoke and all that fun stuff, more or less has nowhere to go and it ended up peppering me in the face. <laughs> Essentially, this is, you know, not the answer I was hoping it would be. For my sake, this gun here on the right will be relegated only to holster use or composite flares. Because this isn't a gun channel, it's a movie filmmaking channel. Normally I wouldn't do this, but there's many uh, gun channels on YouTube that are far more informative than I'm going to be here. But because I mentioned firearms, I think it's only appropriate that I show you how to clear a gun, make sure that it's safe. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is open up the door here. You cock the hammer back till you hear it click once. You check every chamber. Two, three, four, five, six. Just pretend there's 10, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, and just go ahead and just count six more. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the last step that we're gonna do before we call this gun clear is we're just gonna take this, which is called the bore brush. You can get it off Amazon, Walmart, you name it. It's pretty cheap. Any gun shop it would have it. Go ahead and put it in the barrel all right, and pull it out. And when you do that, that action right there, that should remove anything in that barrel that could potentially be harmful. So basically answering that question of why do filmmakers still use real firearms? Um, well, frankly, the short answer, and I don't know how satisfying it's gonna be, is that it looks a lot better, particularly Western blanks. Uh, they give you this beautiful muzzle flash. They give you this huge 
plume of smoke, this fog of war effect, that it's really hard to duplicate that, at least easily, in, in post. You know, how, how much they really just enhance the experience for the audience, and, and I think for the actor, too. To me, it's kind of like, you know, making a Western without blanks is like, you know, Fourth of July without fireworks. I mean, part of the fun is what John Ford said, get them on the horses shooting the guns. I mean, but, uh, you know, obviously, if safety's a, ever a concern, you don't do it. Rule number one of gun safety etiquette is you never, ever, ever point a firearm at a human being. Okay, so what about movies? You know, considering that the first close-up ever was a cowboy aiming directly down the barrel of the camera with the barrel of the gun and shoot, pulling the trigger. A Goodfellas ends with Joe Pesci unloading into the camera and hopefully they're operating it remotely, but you never know. Most sets, big and even really small sets like mine, have an armorer on board who's basically their only job is to supervise the weapons, to distribute the ammunition. Uh, an actor will only be given ammunition, meaning blank ammunition right before he or she's gonna fire the weapon. Uh, how can we employ these these devices in a safe and responsible manner so that we can have fun, we can make you know, hopefully compelling stories. You know, everybody loves a good shoot 'em up action movie, everybody loves a good shoot 'em up Western. There's no reason that that has to change, but it's only fun because it's fake. The guy shoots the bad guy, that guy goes home at night, he's fine. That's, you know, <laughs> that's the reality of it. When something actually happens, oh boy, it's not fun anymore. It's an important video for me to make because I do have a lot of guns in my movies and I'm certainly not the only filmmaker who's guilty of that. I mean, action is conflict and conflict, at least in the modern world, or at least since the invention of gunpowder has been resolved often, sadly, okay, social commentary, but through violence. So, you know, guns are gonna be an inherent part of storytelling. Is that a bad thing? Well, it's not bad or good, it's just a fact. So thanks so much for checking out the video. Um, if you liked it, hit the subscribe, like button, share button, all that good stuff. Um, you know, hopefully I was able to answer that question, why do filmmakers even use real weapons? It seems crazy to have something like that on a set, but hopefully I enlightened. Whether you think we have a good reason or not, I'll leave that to you. Um, but yeah, thanks for checking it out. See you next week. Bye.